And nope. Hello, everyone. It's episode 64 of the Fitness Business Growth Podcast. I'm here with Phil Britton. How are you, mate? G'day, Jamie. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good, mate. You went to martial arts school, so I've got to ask the question. Did you watch UFC 300 yesterday? Because it was an absolute barn burner. I actually didn't. You know, I, I think I'm one of these people uh, who ha have dedicated their whole lives to the industry and sport, but yet I do watch very little UFC. <laughs> really? It's not yeah, that I, uncommon, I watch a little mate. bit, but it's not, it's not high on the priority. Yeah, mate. A lot of martial arts owners that I work with, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, they actually love their their small section of the sport. They just love jiu-jitsu, not necessarily yeah. MMA. So I think, mate, I just, I love it all. Yeah, no, I agree. I do love it. Um, it has its place and it's definitely raised the profile of martial arts since the drop-off of Karate Kid and Chuck Norris. But um, yeah. it's uh, it's it, it's one of those things because we, we're, we're out, my martial arts school is a family-focused school. And so our families and kids and parents that come to us don't really want their kids banging heads on cages, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those interesting things. I think slowly over time, mate, the perception of martial arts is changing, but people still think like they're going to come down and get punched in the face or get strangled. So it is definitely, definitely a bit of a balancing act. Well, mate, yeah. I want to start today's podcast. We obviously met each other through, through to uh, ads for your, your martial arts school. But yeah. on our first call, mate, you told me something really amazing, uh, a traumatic story, a horrendous story. And that book behind you, Undefeated, is what was what has come from it, as well as a, yeah. a public speaking and motivational career, mate. So, Phil, if people don't know who you are, do you want to give them a, a three minute introduction of who you are, what you've been through, what you've overcome, and what you do today? Yeah, sure. So, I guess twenty two years ago, I was uh, on a path to a hopeful professional AFL footy career, and uh, unfortunately, I was blown up in the two thousand and two Bali bombing terrorist attack attacks. I was uh, I was on an end of season footy trip with 19 of my best mates and we were going to let loose party have fun do all those things that the end of footy season trips do but um within six hours of landing we were went from fight having the time of our lives to fighting for our lives um i was burnt to 60 percent of my body i lost seven mates i nearly died several times i was lost presumed dead for 12 hours um that story right. in itself is is an incredible one of, of fate and luck as well uh, but life's, life's not easy and life's not hard. And even after surviving the terrorist attack, um, you know, I spiraled out of control, survivor guilt, what will life look like with all the burns, um, depression, drugs, alcohol, you know, the hole just got deeper and bigger. And unfortunately, uh, it was just, it, for me, there was just no way out. Uh, I fell into the opportunity to go and share my story about six months after the bombing. I wasn't ready. I didn't want to, um, but the strategy I was using was putting me deeper in the hole. So I had to try something else. So I, uh, I got invited to a Lions Club for about with about twelve or so people, and uh, I just shared my story for the first time. I'm telling you right now, I was like shivering. I was shaking, tears strolling down my cheeks because it was the first time I'd literally stepped through it all to these strangers. And that room of twelve wrinkly old faces, they they rose, they, they stood up, and they clapped louder than a room of a thousand and yeah. it kind of was at that moment right there that i realized maybe maybe this is why i survived you know we all have those voices the negative one and the positive one and it was like maybe this is why you're here phil maybe this is why i survived to, to share this story yeah. um yeah there's, it was... there's, there's so much to unpack there mate so let's go back to 2002 potential afl career how old are you at the time i was 22 22 and then you're over there end of season trip you're a perth boy not that far of a flight get off the flight straight to cooters yeah. straight to those <laughs> nightclubs having the time of your life and yeah. i want to try and be as sensitive as possible but like what happened half hour before before that attack like was it just like like business as usual was there any anything at all was there like no, nothing no nah, mate we were we were there it was our first night and you know it was it's quite interesting because that night we went out for dinner um, and we're all sort of split and divided. Half of us wanted to go out and party being the first night. And the other half were like, hey, we've been drinking all day already. Uh, maybe we should just lay low tonight. Um, but the majority the majority won. We ended up just turning the corner around to the Sari Club. Uh, we were the first sort of big group there. It was quite empty at that point. Um, and as the night went on, it just started getting more full. You know, other football teams, soccer teams, rugby teams, all the girls were rocking in. And as... You can expect, you know, we were we were having a few drinks and having a time of our lives. And I remember you, super I'll, clearly, I'll jump in there, mate. You mentioned yeah. survivor's guilt. Throughout that day, 
there'd be so many sliding door moments where like some wanted to stay home and then some wanted to go out. So I can imagine the majority in that group that wanted to go out, any of the survivors like would have given anything just to go back to that moment. Yeah. And look, and you know, 20, 20, over 20 years uh, after I've met so many other people in that environment who had those sliding door with Motorman as well. But for us, yeah, it was really tough. And for me, I was the captain of the league football team. I sort of had a responsibility to, to look after the crew, you know, but um, yeah, it was, it was super, super challenging. But it, it, even in that moment, like in me knowing what I wanted to do, I'd, I'd literally days just got off the phone call from one of the waffle clubs over here. I had played quite a high level when I was 16, um, but got injured and, and, and took up martial arts instead. So this was my rebirth. This is my comeback, my last ditch chance at, at making AFL. And uh, I remember leaning against the bar at that point, um, you know, quite intoxicated, but challenged in my thoughts. Uh, on one hand, I'm thinking, you know, wow, I've got this opportunity. It's my lifelong dream, childhood, you know, focus for me. And then I'm looking at the dance floor, all my buddies, my friends, smiling, dancing, and, you know, the years I've just spent with them in the amateur club. And I'm thinking, mm. man, is, am I making the right choice here? Do I, is this really what I want or do I want to be here? And, and my good mate, Laurie, he was a rather large lad, older than I was, um, sort of a father figure, manager at the club. He came over and said, he said something to me. He said, Phil, mate, always take your opportunities, but more importantly, always follow your heart. And uh, it was that moment at 22, it just became clear. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. Hey, Laurie, hold that thought, mate. I'm going to buy you a beer. I'm just going to go to the Dunny. So I uh, I stagger off towards the back of the, the nightclub, the Sari Club, to go to the toilet. And it wasn't until I got about halfway across the dance floor that I heard uh, what I thought was a firework. Um, but later on, I realized that was the backpack bomb that blew up at the Paddy's Bar, which is across the road. So wow. literally... A dude walked in with a backpack in the Paddy's bar, went right into the middle and blew up that nightclub. Seconds later, that was a decoy. It was a strategy to get everyone out in the street to get the, you know, a massive impact. Literally seconds later, 900 kilos of explosives in a minivan blew up out the front of the Sari Club, 20 meters from where I was. All right. And like the, another sliding doors moment, like if you didn't go to the bathroom, would have your situation been different like like how close were you and like like i know some of your teammates but like, tragically passed away like what was that next three hours six hours 12 hours like yeah I, I can only liken it almost like you know you hear the the stories in america about tornadoes ripping through towns and one house was fine and the others just missing right and so even in that nightclub there were people who protected people there was a might have been a wooden pillar that protected someone from something else and it didn't really matter where you were it was just luck um, for me I got thrown across the room it felt like I was in a tumble washer it's it was it was feel it felt like I was suspended and, and time was forever but it was you know milliseconds that I was in the air and then I'm I'm blowing and I've I've, uh, I've been wedged between this, what I think was a bar and I had roofing and battens and bodies all over me. So I'm covered with all this shrapnel and battens from the roofing and bodies. And we're just, I'm just under this mess. And at that point, I just don't know what's going on. Like, right. It's, it's black. My hearing's not working. I, I can't see anything. I feel this pain in my mouth. I start pushing the rubble off me. Um, bodies, you can feel arms and legs. And I get to my my feet. It, it, it would have felt like it would have felt like a bad dream. Like it was you, like a horror movie, you know. Like it was just like you see these things on TV or, or on films and stuff like that, but it was real. And the weight and the realness and the smell and the and the the sound, you know, like and that's sort of what I felt was as I got to my feet, it was like I found fully investigated my mouth. It felt like I'd been punched square in the face by Mike Tyson. Right, my teeth were all missing. I had blood you know pulling out of my mouth and at that point i'm like oh my lord what's going on um all my front teeth are missing i hear this sound from the corner of a room saying stay calm it's just a gas bottle but in that moment i could like taste the chemicals in the air and 20, i could smell 22 years later it's such a vivid memory for you like it, like the details the smell the sound yeah i just like i guess what i've done and why you know you see that book back there is I, from an early point I reflected and and went back on that night and I've taken my story to pieces because I just felt like when I tell my story, I want the people to feel it, smell it, and I want them to be there 
because I don't want them just to read a, the pages. I want them to feel like they're there. And so for me, like yeah. every time I retell the story, I'm reliving it as well. Yeah. But, you know, I compartmentalize yeah. those feelings. It's, it's, it's one thing to hear that over 80 people die, but it's enough, people just, it's, it's, a, well, it's not a throwaway comment, but just it doesn't seem real until you have someone telling you like, hey, like bodies were on top of me. I had yeah. blood coming out of my mouth. I had to clear the way. And I, I mentioned in your book, just the smell. You kept mentioning the smell. Yeah. Look, yeah, it was just that the smell of the chemicals. And every time you breath, you breathed in, you could taste it and it hurt. And then all of a sudden, like from the from the the taste and the smell, then walls of fire just start fall um, appearing, right? Woof, that's roof falling. You could hear alcohol bottles popping. Like that heat was so intense, so quick. You could hear pop, 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 um, and the heat was so intense. It was it'd be like sitting front row at a at like an NRL stadium, and you know the bonfire is as big as the field, and you're sitting front row. Um, so so at, but, at that at that moment, like, did you think it was like just like a an explosion, like like a, like literally like a an explosion from something that happened in the nightclub, like like an error or, or a gas bottle? There there would have been no thought that hey, this was a terrorist attack. Oh, look, I didn't know it was a terrorist attack, um, but I definitely thought, I definitely knew it was bigger than a gas bottle. I definitely knew it was bigger than something else, but <clears throat> you don't get time to think, what is it? You're at fight and flight, right? You're, you're thinking survival. And so at that point of, you know, walls fire, um, thatch roof falling, people screaming, you can hear like men and women screaming and those screams then go from ear piercing to to murmuring and they're not even there. You just knew that people were dying right there and then in that place. Um, and and so at that point it was like, all right, I got to get out of here. I got to I got to move. I got to get out of here because it's all coming on fire. So 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 speaking about like putting people in that situation so they can relive it and feel it with you. Like at that point, like did did did, did the thought cross your mind like, hey, I'm either going to die, or I'm going to get up and get out of here. Yeah, that moment comes in a minute. Um, yeah, so that that first moment was, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And it's like I'm running, I'm getting out of here. And, but there's fire everywhere. There's walls everywhere. And I look to my left, and there's one wall that's not on fire. And so I, I walk over there. I'm barefooted. I'm trudging through glass. Like I'm stepping in pools of blood. I can feel arms on my legs. And I, I get to this wall, and it looks impossible. So I look around. There's a little milk crate or a retaining wall. I jump on that. I jump as high as I can. I get my fingertips just on the wall. And as I got to pull myself up, I slip and I fall all the way back into the fire. And uh, at that point, I'm like, oh my, I've just fallen. I'm, I'm in fire. I didn't know I'm being burned at this stage. I just knew that it was hot. Um, I peel myself up. I look around me. Fire's creeping in. People are starting to push me in that area. I get to the wall again. I jump and I can feel the top of the wall on my chest. I'm about to put my foot over the top. And then all of a sudden I feel hands grab my hair and hands grab my shoulders and I'm being pulled down by all these other people behind me. I'm being used as a ladder basically. So I'm holding on the wall. I've got people trying to climb over me. I'm trying to pull myself up to, to live. And then I, I, I slip, I let go. I, we all fall down. And I, for me, that was my second time I fell down. And literally at that point was my give up moment, right? I I and, curl up in this. And was this, was this like, from explosion to, to fingers on the wall trying to get out, was that a minute? Was that two minutes? Was that 30 seconds? Like how quick did this happen? Uh, it would have to be like within five minutes. Like it was, you know what I mean? Because there's just a lot going on and there's, you know, I'm trying to, I'm giving you the, the sort of the shorter version yeah. of, of all the little bits. But, um, and time is very, uh, it's very hard to comprehend, I guess, to put into place because what feels like for um, a short amount of time feels it's like forever in that moment it's, it's true what they say when when you're about to die time literally stands still but it's just going fast going past real quick so you're on the and wall that might... you're on the wall you get pulled back into the fire for the second time you have that yeah. i'm gonna live or i'm gonna die what is going through your head in that situation mate I'm, I'm curled up i'm literally about to give up at the age of 22 i've got nothing left no emotion no energy um and were you in, up and this, and this might sound like a stupid question were you in physical pain like were you like or was the adrenaline that flight or fight just so intense that you just like what, what was yeah. that like there were the adrenaline was huge i didn't know what pain i was in look i knew my teeth were missing i knew i had blood coming out of my mouth um but at that point i didn't really know the state of my injuries how bad it was i was just survival right and so i'm curled up in this fetal position i'm literally about to give up 
I don't want to go anymore. I failed twice. And uh, in that moment, this is that sort of that that moment of of time passing so quickly, but in reality, in, in my mind was suspended. My mind drifts to at the age of 22. If I don't get out of here, I'm not going to meet the woman of my dreams. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have a house. You know, all the things that you expect to have in life are flashing through my head right now and going, Phil, you got to get out. And so I, I just get myself up. I stand up and look at that wall and said, I'm getting, I'm getting out now. And, and that's the funny thing, right? I can remember clearly how I failed two times, but that third time, it was like I was a rocket. I launched, I'm on top of that wall. I'm out of the nightclub. And so uh, looking back and, and I guess this, you know, how I, how I share this as a motivational speaker um, is that when your why is so big, the how doesn't matter. You might've heard that saying before. And it really was that first two times, you know, I was, I was fighting for my life. It was me and me and life, me and death. And then I needed to go somewhere. I needed, to, I needed my back against the wall. I needed to dive deeper into something that I never knew I wanted that gave me the strength to get out of that, you know, the fire. What was your why? What was that? What was that anchor? It, 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 it was at 22, you know, not wanting a life, wanting a wife, wanting kids, wanting to keep teach the kicker footy, you know, all these things that, that, that we expect to have in life. And it was, you know, I never knew I wanted that at the age of 22. I just wanted to pursue football, you know. <laughs> um, mm. but in that moment it was just like holy moly I, I need I need to survive not just for me but you know for generations that are going to come hopefully if I do survive so you, you climb over the wall there was a bomb outside the nightclub to you're outside the nightclub like is it fair to say like the immediate life-threatening danger is gone like you're just does the pain set in there does that like what I was just in that terrorist attack like what is that next moment like when, when you escape that immediate danger yeah, so I'm on top of the wall. I, uh, I crawl across the neighbouring roof. The neighbouring roof had all its roof tiles blown off. So I crawl across the roof, legs falling through the roof. I'm trying not to fall. It's like a two-storey sort of height building. And I get to the very top of the, the, the neighbouring building. And that's when I felt it for the first time. Um, if you can imagine, I don't know if you've been really badly sunburnt before, Jamie. you got a pretty fair skin. You probably look like you've been sunburnt before. Um, um, but just imagine... <laughs> being third degree sunburn all over like sunburn as sunburn can be and your mate flaps you in your back and it's like oh far out mate don't, don't, don't. that's what i felt it was like what is this it was the first experience of the pain that i that i that i had and so i in 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 response to pain i rip my singlet off and all the skin off my back comes with it oh far out i, th I throw it down i'll crawl off that neighboring roof um i'm i'm asking for help actually in fact just to give you a bit of reference, um, someone took a photo of me escaping that nightclub, and uh, the there's a photo of me escaping. That is one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life. Fire up! And so when I when I talk about the book, you know, I'm, I'm you know that could have been the last photo that my mum ever saw of me. You know what I mean? Like. And I just remember at that point asking for help, the smoke inhalation, I'm trying to get help. I saw flashes, didn't really, really know what it was. Obviously someone taking photos. I've jumped off the wall. I ran out the, the alleyway. I looked to my right. There's the bomb. There's the, the, the car bomb. There's the, the fire, the commotion, the craziness. And to the left, there's none of that. So I run and I run as fast as I can. It felt like the faster I ran, the less it hurt until I got about 50 metres up the road. And that was the moment that I went, holy shit, what about my mates? And so I'm torn between running or going back. With your AFL team, you being the captain, you feeling a sense of responsibility. How many teammates were inside with you? How many survived? And how many did you did you see after? Yeah, so just for the stats, so 202 people died in total, 88 Australians. Seven of my mates, which was the highest toll on a team uh, of my mates died. 13 of us survived and uh, two of us got uh, reasonably, uh, my, my lorry who I was speaking to got a little bit burned on his arm and I was obviously the, the one who got seriously injured. The rest of my mates, you know, they might not have got the physical scars, but they were dragging people out of that nightclub. They, what they saw and what they had to do that night, but also in the days after to find the remains of my friends, you know, looking in the morgue, searching the hospital, 
going back looking for bits and pieces, you know, it's like there's so many layers of terrorism and obviously a situation like this that affects people in different ways. So you run up the road, you're in hospital, 60% burns to your body. What is the next seven days like for you? Like, are you, are you cognitive? Do you know what's going on? Do you know it was a terrorist attack or are you on pain? Like what was that next seven days like? Yeah, look, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of fast forward it. So at that point I'm 50 meters up the road. Um, lucky enough, the choice to run or choice to go back was taken away from me. Expats that were living in Bali, they had the only car that wasn't on fire on that street. And as they were escaping, their um, lights shone across me. And at that moment, I'm standing there thinking of going back, thinking of running. And the grandson in the car said they had sheets of skin 30 centimetres long hanging off my arms. And he said, oh, we got to save this kid. So they grabbed me, put me in the car. I'm fighting them off, off them. Skin's falling off as they're trying to grab me. I'm thinking they're the ones that did it to me. They, they couldn't really calm me down. So they took me on this uh, you know, survival journey, which I'm so blessed for. Um, but in that moment, because they took me on a, on, a, on a bit of a path, that's why I was missing, presumed dead for 12 hours. I wasn't found uh, by my teammates until Sunday, 12 o'clock. Um, and at that point, I really didn't know still what was going on. It was hard. It was tough. Um, finally getting out of, you know, the, the whole ordeal at the Bali hospital, you know, you think that there's going to be organised uh, doctors, procedures. You, you, I'm thinking Western world hospitals. Mm. Uh, Sangla Hospital was a war zone. There was blood everywhere, people not knowing what to do. Um, finally got out of uh, Dal- uh, sorry, uh, Bali and I arrived in Darwin. I was on the last plane out of, of Bali in the Hercules. And uh, by the time I landed in Darwin, the Perth hospital was full. And all I remember is getting pulled in real quick into a, like off the tarmac in an ambulance and into a room. And I just remember them trying to find a vein because I'd lost so much blood. And they, I just remember passing out to the feeling of warm blood dripping all over my legs as I found an, an artery to, to pump blood in. I had 40 blood transfusions, Jamie. 40 blood transfusions in my uh, recovery. How the long doctor you, said to me. How, yeah, how long were you in hospital for back in Darwin? Uh, literally just that night, uh, next thing, uh, that day. And then I got on a, a short, small little uh, light aircraft flying doctors all the way to Royal Adelaide Hospital, where I was hospitalized for two and a half months in Royal Adelaide Hospital in the intensive unit. Two and a half months, 10 weeks. Yeah. And over that 10 weeks, you had the 40 blood transfusions. Like what? What does that uh, and you had, well, what does that look like? Are, are they waiting for your skin to repair? Are they worried about infection? Like, like w- what was happening over those ten weeks? Yeah, look, I had uh, three major skin graft oper- operations. My back. We basically, I tell people, being burnt is probably the worst experience that you can ever have. But what's being worse than being burnt is is uh, how, where they take the skin from to put on your burnt skin. And so the recovery of burns is actually 10 times worse than the burns itself. And so because I had so much skin, obviously burnt, um, you know, some areas took quite well. My back had infection. Every time I sat up, you could see green. It was disgusting. It wouldn't take. Um, And so I had three major skin graft operations to finally get to the point where they were happy with with the um, operations. And in that period, obviously, 40 blood transfusions to to get back to, to surviving. And um, yeah, I, I was crucifixed in the bed, mate. Like, you know, they, they don't want your burns to heal here. When, when I came out of hospital, I couldn't even touch my face. I couldn't brush my teeth. Burns had healed so tight. So I was crucifixed. And they said, Phil, you, you're not leaving Royal Adelaide Hospital. You're not going back to Perth until you can walk a full lap of the hallway of the uh, burns ward there. And so literally just as a time frame, I could not even move a thumb. I couldn't even wiggle a toe when I woke up. And, yeah, far and so over those two months, I had to learn to sit up. I had to learn to move. I had to learn to walk. Um, and all while I'm focusing on my own recovery, I had to hear that they finally found Corey. They found a wallet. They found this. There was still hope in those short days um, that, you know, there might have been survivors. But um, un- unfortunately, uh, I missed I missed all that. And obviously, uh, being in hospital in Adelaide, missed all the funerals of my mates as well. The 10 weeks is a long time to be in hospital to think about what just happened. And also 22 years old, 
what does your future have in store for you? Like how, how dark was that, that 10 weeks for you and, and what type of thoughts and feelings did you have like about the rest of your life moving forward? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't know about you, Jamie, but I'd never seen anyone, I'd never seen anyone burnt before, like not significantly. Um, and so at the age of 22, you know, like, uh, without, you know, you know, big noting myself, I was a 22 bronze skin, long hair, surfy AFL footballer. You know, I felt like, you know, life was pretty good. <laughs> mm. And then next thing you know, like I'm um, this, this blood covered, scarred covered, um, no teeth mess of a person. And, and uh, yeah, we, you just don't have a positive outlook on life. Literally there were every day that I wish I died because what would life look like? And uh, it was like, sometimes they say you've got to take things day by day, but in those moments, it's like, you've got to take your thoughts minute by minute and, um, and you've got to try and just have people around you. You've got to, you know, you know I don't know. It's just, you just got to get through it. You got, there's no way out of the valley of death. You have to walk through it, you know? And throughout that 10 weeks, you would have started having visitors. Who was the first person to see you? Um, so I didn't really have visitors because I'm I'm uh, a Perth boy. I was lucky enough that my mum uh, had flown over. My girlfriend at the time flew over at some point, but it was mainly just my mum. And so really she was my support person. She was the only person who would, you know, would come daily. Uh, but even then, like, I was so angry at everyone and uh, I would tell my mum, get out, you know, and leave me alone. Or she would bump the bed and it would hurt. And I'm like, you know, piss off, you know, it was, I was angry at the whole world. It was just not a nice place to be in. We started the podcast with you saying that you felt like there was no point living. You didn't know what you were going to do, drinking, drugs, depression. You left the hospital. How long is that period of, of sorrow before you, you gave that first speech and effectively, I guess, gave you a new life, a, a new meaning, a new purpose to live? Yeah, look, I, I finally got um, was able to walk uh, a length of the hallway and was able to go back to Perth. And um, I guess this is where I, I never knew I had this within me. I guess you know I, I hate losing. I always I'm I'm a, I'm a winner. Um, you know what I mean? I I'm always the captain. I'm always the champion. I'm always the winner. You know, and like I'm very competitive. And, and even when I don't, it's all good. But you know, I'm always going to try and win. Do not. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so when doctors said, mate, you're not going to walk you know, anytime soon or you, you know, can't leave until you, you do a lap. I'm like, I'm doing it. And that uh, doctor said, Phil, you, you, you're you not going to play footy again, mate. Why don't you just, just relax? And I'm like, no, I'm doing it. Um, and so, so although I was in a full burns pressure suit, although I had so many restrictions when I came out, um, I set a goal to, to play football again. And I, I, I've ended up playing my first game of football six months after, which is about coinciding with the first time that I uh, spoke about my experience. And, um, and yeah, I remember playing in a full Burns pressure suit. I didn't need a mouth guard because I had no teeth. <laughs> yeah. um, I still had open wounds. I literally, during the training sessions, had to pour blood out of my boot every time yeah. I trained. From, um, memory, from memory, there was, a, there was a Kangaroos player who was in the Bali bombings, I believe, and he ended up playing yeah. in a professional game. Yeah, Jason McCartney. We became very good friends. In actual fact, uh, I have a little bit of a, a poke and joke with him because as I was preparing for my first game, he rang me up and said, Phil, I'm preparing for my first game and it's going to be on this day. I said, mate, that's the same day I'm playing. <laughs> but mm. uh, he flew me over to that game and I actually flicked the, the coin in the middle of the field for his first game. And so oh, I relinquished the, the, the quickest comeback to, to Jason and I came back the, day, the week after. So you're at the Lions Club, you give that speech... You've just literally gone through hell on earth. You're shaking, quivering, shivering, emotional. You gave that speech. What was what was that speech? And why was that such a powerful moment for you to think, hey, like I, I've got a story to tell. I can inspire others. Well, I think the re there was two things that happened. And and I remember uh, when that, they, they clapped, right? I'm thinking some of these faces would have seen more war or death than I ever have or ever will. Do you know what I mean? These are old people, Lions clubs probably lived through the wards, you know what I mean? And, and I'm thinking, and they're clapping for me. And so there was just this understanding that may, maybe if these people who've overcome such significant things in their life, they're clapping for me, maybe they're seeing something in me that I, that I can't. And then as I'm about to walk off, 
you know, the negative voice says, who do you think you are, Phil? You're not a speaker. Get back to that hole. Drink yourself deeper. You know, like give up. Like you're not a speaker. You can't do that. And, and I definitely wasn't. I'm not. A, I, I'm actually a, an introvert by nature. Um, but I've learned, obviously, through martial arts, through teaching, through instructing, through this, to become who I am on stage. Um, but it was that moment I was still about to walk off the stage, off this little stage that had this this old bloke on a Zimmer frame. He, um, he's got his hand out, he's shaking. I'm thinking, oh, this guy's a bit frail. He grabs me. His handshake was like a 35-year-old brick player. He pulls me in and says, Phil, keep sharing your story, son. I wish I had the courage to speak out. And it was just literally that moment like, that gave me the courage, that that the desire to want to keep doing it. And so if you know Lions Clubs, they like to raise money um, and donate uh, for certain things. And so after that, someone came up and said, Phil, where can we donate to? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, can we raise money for you or something like that? And I'm like, well, I, I really don't know. I just literally came out of here to, to release <laughs> all these things that I've been holding back. And so what happened from there is the Lions Club, uh, someone helped me out. And I went through a bit of a tour for the next three to six months speaking at all the Lions Clubs in WA, I raised $20,000 and I donated it to the Burns unit. And so I forced myself in six months to tell my story over and over and over again. There were days that I didn't want to do it. There were days I cried more than others, um, but I had a purpose. It was the raising of the money for the Burns unit that helped save me. And I felt better because I was getting all these demons out of me and getting the response back from other people that, wow, you're inspiring. Wow, you're amazing. And I just, I guess that moment just continued to inspire me to keep wanting to do it and since then you've got on to do do more public speaking do you find that your public speaking is it more like overcoming adversity is it no matter how down you've been like you can pull yourself out of it what type of speech do, do you like like delivering and who was your speech for yeah so as a keynote speaker uh, and workshop trainer uh it's leadership mindset and resilience down to a T, those, those three things are my is my lane way for sure. Um, I'm helping people overcome what they think is, you know, what's stopping them. And I'm letting them know that everyday people like me or you, Jamie, can can overcome anything. And But we don't have to go through a terrorist attack. We don't have to lose a son to cancer. So we don't have to have a car accident or lose an arm. You know, unfortunately, sometimes these things happen and other people have really great perspectives and go, well, now I'm going to live my life. But my thing is like, you don't have to. We all have this hidden potential within us to be, do and have whatever we want. But we have to find that why we have to we have to search for it. And we have to dive deep, and and those who want it enough will get it. But you have to want it enough, you know. How do you help people discover their why? I'll go through a process. You know, these are things that you know we do in our workshops and training sessions to really get them to understand um, why they're doing what they're doing. I did a a string of motivational talks in the mining communities up here in Western Australia, for example. There's a lot of suicide. You know, they do long hours. You know, and the money's good. And I'll give you an example is um, I said to one of the miners out in the group, I said, why are you guys out here? What, what, what's the purpose of being out of here? And obviously the big answer was money, mate, you know, to earn money. And so I asked, do you mind if I challenge you a little bit? And uh, so I asked, you know, what's the purpose of that money? And then they would, you know, go a little deeper to, to give my family a good house. And what does that make you feel? And, you know, to makes me feel like I'm a role model, that I'm doing something. And why is that important to you? And they go, because my dad was never there because, you know, they were an alcoholic or because I had this in my life. And I said, this is why you're here. If you think you're out here for the money, it's not deep enough. We have to drill deeper to find the real reason why. And that's what spurs you on in those early mornings and late nights at work. That's what gets us up to go for that walk or jog or run or go to the gym because we have that reason why when it's surface level, it's not enough. We have to be curious, like the curious two-year-old. If you've got kids, Jamie, you you, you, you Kids ask, why, daddy? Why, why, why? And yeah. we have to ask the same thing. Why and dive deep. Yeah, I haven't got kids, mate, but it's just, it's literally sales, sales 101. Like I want to get healthy and fit. Why? Yeah. And just yeah. expand, 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 expand. You've got to find the button, mate. Because they're terrified of being at their son's wedding in a dress and they do not want to get a photo on one of the happiest days of their life. That's the person's why, not because they want to get yeah. healthy and fit. So you yeah. mentioned leadership mindset. Resilience. I mean, I think resilience is, is one that I want to explore a little bit deeper because it's not uncommon to think that people of my generation and the generation below me have no resilience. The ability mm. to tolerate stress, the ability to tolerate adversity, like it's almost laughable. 
what they've been through compared to what you've been through and for them to be, have that negative outlook on life. How do you, how do you help someone build resiliency? Look, when, when no, no one is ever born resilient. Um, you know, if I, I've had this asked of me so many times and it's really hard to answer. Like, uh, how have you become so resilient or how would someone become more resilient? And there, there are a few things that you can do to help you be resilient, resilient, but essentially it's going through tough times and hopefully not big all the time like what I've been through, but going through tough times, falling over and grazing your knee. You know, as a kid, you know, how bad did you want to ride a bike? It didn't matter how many times you fall over, you kept going. And so resilience is built over time. And I've always said to people that um, it's a perspective, right? Rather than thinking, why me? Or below the line performance, excuse denial, you know, and all these other things. It's like, well, these things are happening for a reason to strengthen me. And all these failures, all the times I've tripped over, all the times I've scraped the knee. And, and these are all the fertilizers. That's all the shit. That's all the fertilizer to my growth of the future. And so we, uh, as, you know, as a father of three, I can't protect my kids from all the tough times. They need to fall over. They need to experience what hardship is. They need to know what um, what struggle is. You know what I mean? Not to go through it on purpose, but they have to build up the small resilience so that when the big thing happens, they have the resilience to overcome it. Yeah, and they, they go through resiliency, they overcome it. It gives them confidence to overcome the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And yeah. it's almost their tolerance for stress, like, like a plate, their plate just becomes larger and larger and larger and you can throw more shit on there and it's not going to yep. break them, but if they never ever go through any resiliency or you coddle then like the first sign of struggle. Yeah. And so look at the end of the day, you know, some people might not disagree with me, but you know, it, we, we as a culture we're 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 modicoddling our kids too much and we're giving them everything they want. We're doing it from a kindness place. Most people are doing it because they want to help their kids. The natural retrospect that the equal and opposite effect is it's actually it's causing a negative effect on their growth as a team. That's why there's high suicides, high self-harm. You know, there's so many things that these kids, teens and young adults are experiencing that we've never experienced with, you know, media and stuff like that and online. Um, but by protecting them, we're actually not exposing them to the things that they need to be exposed to. Almost every single person I look up to has gone through hard times. Yeah, 100%. Um you know, if part of what I do is, as a speaker, I also train other speakers and coaches how to take their pain, their mess, their message, and turn it into a story, turn it into an online course or, or a coaching program. And so I always say um, for my clients that you're most powerfully positioned to help and serve the person you once were. And so from a speaker's point of view or a trainer or a coach, we go, if I was there and now I'm here, I need to be looking at helping these people. And from a martial arts instructor point of view, you know, you have to be two levels above the people that you're teaching. And the, and the act of teaching actually gives me the skills that I need to elevate myself. So it's a reciprocal uh, effect, you know what I mean? So you started speaking and then you opened up Life Martial Arts. What has that done for you? And what has that given you? And, and what is the, what is the, it's just one of those things I find is misunderstood martial arts is like, should kids do martial arts? Yes or no? 100%. Um, my and, answer and, is... And why? Yeah, my, my answer is um, martial arts is the vehicle that delivers life skills and character development skills. And so martial arts is the vehicle. No, we're not teaching to fight or you know, all these things, although there's punches and kicks. We're not teaching them to go out and do those things. If they need it, they've got it for self-defense. Um, but what it does, it builds confidence. It builds resilience. It builds respect. It builds all these things that, unfortunately, that parents are not giving their kids uh, and even adults as well it gives them a place to, to to be and grow and become more than what they are just just the act of chasing colored belts and tips in the process just the act of, of following a martial arts system that does that teaches you to set goals teaches you that if you fail you're not good enough you've got to go back and work a little bit harder and eventually you'll get there do you know what i mean uh, uh, what we say is that a, a black belt is just a white belt that never gave up and i'd love an example of, of something that you do in your martial arts skill school to instill that, like, what is, what is the first thing you do? Like, and what, what is like, do you have any, any examples of kids that have come in terrible experience that have turned around and, and gone on to something much bigger? 
Look, the, the list is long um, and we've had kids that come in so shy that they can't look behind a paper plate that they put in front of their face and now they're police officers. I've got kids that have come in that have uh, have, have been, you know, bullies or, you know, have been bullied themselves and have become um, military, uh, airline, uh, pilot, uh, air force pilots, you know what I mean? There's, there's so many stories of kids that come in one way and even adults that come in one way and they go out another and there's no one thing that we do. It's all the things that we do in the journey. And it, it is that in that class, it's to set boundaries. It's to show them what respect is. It's to, to say, hey, if I'm speaking to you, you look into my eyes, that shows respect. Show respect by looking into my eyes, shaking my hand and tell me your name. I mean, what, other than a parent, what, who, who teaches that to kids, right? Mm. <laughs> so we just, we, we expect our kids in our classes and even our adults to perform, to act, and to uh, and to be a certain way on the floor and we say that your black belt just holds your pants up but how we expect you to behave here in the dojo and in the school is exactly how we want you to behave out there in the real world at school at work in in everyday environments and so when somebody is this way and the same out there well they're going to be successful right yeah it's, it's so I've, like I just love whether it's martial arts, whether it's any form of exercise, the pursuit of something that takes you a long time to achieve, i.e. a black belt, that in itself is going to build resiliency because there's going to be so many issues along the way. Like I think like like a, a, a an eighth Dan jujitsu black belt master, it's like 60 years. Like like how many <laughs> how many people pursue the same thing for 60 years without giving up? It's truly remarkable. It is amazing. And people do, you know, I've been doing it for 26 years. I'm a, a six degree black belt in, in my main style. And, and, and what is that style, go, oh, mate? What is uh, that style? It's a freestyle, freestyle karate. Okay. And um, uh, so I have probably about four different instruct black belt level instruct levels in different styles and arts um, from Muay Thai to Krav Maga to freestyle karate to other bits and pieces as well. But um when people say, you know, when's your next belt? And I say, well, in seven years, <laughs> that's my next rank in that style is seven years. If I want my seventh Dan, I have to wait seven years and I have to participate in martial arts for seven years on a regular basis. <laughs> so when people look at that, they go, oh, my one month that I have to wait for my tip or, you know, my six months that I have to wait for my belt is very small. <laughs> Going through what you went through in 2002, mate, going through that dark period, coming out the other side, inspiring others. It's a loaded question, but like, what, what is the, what is the overall message that you want to, you want to share with the world? What is the overall message that Phil is trying to get across to people that you interact with? I, I, I just want people to understand that um, if you want to be someone, if you want to do something, if you want to achieve anything that you can and if you want to be unstoppable, well, you know, just do those things that become unstoppable. If you want to leave, lead an extraordinary life and have extraordinary things, you have to do extraordinary things. If you're just live, wanting to play good, that's fine. If you want ordinary, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Sometimes I go, oh, maybe I just want an ordinary life or a nine to five or this and that, but I don't. I want more time with my family. I want more money to give me more freedom. I want extraordinary things. And just by wanting those things isn't enough. I have to know and identify what are those extraordinary things that I need to do? What are the extraordinary ways that I need to think? And what are the extraordinary ways that I have to behave in life to, to pursue these things? Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's not, there's no magic recipe and there's no magic pill. There is a long list of things we can all do if we want the things that we want. And unfortunately, we live in a life where we want them, but we're not willing to do the things. And that's where I'm at. It's like, what are we doing? And let's set those goals and let's actually achieve them. Yeah. And you don't need to go through one of the most horrific things anyone's ever gone through to realize you've got one life. You need to live it to the absolute fullest. And just, I think just the lack of perspective, myself included, of just how lucky we are to be Monday morning on a podcast, breathing oxygen, food in the fridge, like life is good. Life is precious. Like, and whatever you worried about yeah. today, you didn't get blown up at a nightclub. So you're going to be okay. Hey man, look at this. I always say like, I'm not trying to scare anyone. Like we don't know what's going to happen when we drive out here and go down the road. You know, unfortunately we saw what happened in Bondi, oh, the, the stabbing that happened. You know what I mean? It's terrible. Like we don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes, in 10 months, in 10 years. So you got one life to live it. And it's so cliche, but it's true. Like, um, 
I, if, if you take care of the days, the years take care of themselves. Too, people, too many people get lost in my life. What is 10 years? I'm like, mate, what can you do to set up today as your best day? And if you keep doing that day in, day out, you're going to have an incredible life. Well, mate, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. I was a bit worried about asking certain questions, but you were so open, <laughs> so honest, so vivid. And I think just like for someone to hear what you went through, like, because you hear terrorist attack, but you don't actually feel it and you're there. And man, I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And man, like you're super inspiring. I appreciate it, mate. Thanks for having me, Jamie. No, you're more than welcome, Phil. Thanks so much, mate. Cheers.